I want to welcome everyone to Luminarts Not So Live, featuring our creative writing fellows. My name is Jason Kalajanin. I'm the director of the Luminarts Cultural Foundation. Um, today, we are really looking forward to hearing from both Annie Diamond and Carly Gomez, who will be reading from their work. And then we're going to have a facilitated kind of Q&A conversation that will be moderated by Lou Watts. Um, and it will also include several of our other fellows who are on the Zoom with us today. So we're really excited about that and to get everyone's input. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Leslie Haviland, who's our program director. And Leslie is really the person responsible for both this um, presentation, but then also all the other Luminarts Not So Lives that you've been enjoying over the past several months. Um, so thank you so much, Leslie. And with that, over to you. Great, thanks, Jason. Um, thank you all for being here today. Um, it's exciting to see everybody um, in this context and be able to connect in some way during this whole pandemic. So thank you all for being here. Um, and I'd like to introduce Lou Watts, who is a Luminarts board member. Um, Lou is also a very talented writer himself. And he is a past creative writing juror for the Luminarts Creative Writing Fellowship. And he's been a kind of, you know, a mentor for these types of things and a fabulous person to work with for me. So um, I hope I hope we all enjoy this facilitated conversation today and reading. Um, Lou, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Oh, thanks, Leslie. Thanks, Jason. So um, it's a pleasure really to introduce uh, both Carly and, and Annie. And I've had the pleasure of speaking with both of them um, beforehand and also in the last week. Uh, um, Carly's going to go first and read some uh, beautiful prose. Uh, I'll probably ask a question at the end of it, and then Annie will follow with some of her poetry, and I'll ask a question there, and then open it up for discussion. So some background on Carly. Uh, she's a PhD student at uh, the University of Missouri, and from what I understand, just about to finish. And uh, uh, part of the PhD thesis, or the PhD process, I didn't know this, is that you actually write a novel. And uh, so she has a novel completed, but what she's going to read from today is something new that she started writing uh, during the pandemic. There's a lot more I can say about you, Carly, but I'm gonna keep it short and hand over to you. Thank you so much, Lou. And thank you to Luminarts and Leslie and Jason for hosting this. So I'm gonna read an excerpt from my new book, Mercedes, and this is the very beginning. Havana was this way, pruned palm parks, Chevys and Buicks, matte green or sparkling blue water like postcard ocean view from hotel verandas, silk sand beaches, sticky wet between toes and oil slick shoulders, cocktails room salty and sweet, teetering between jeweled fingers, stiff curve loving dress hems flicking in time with jazz standards and big band shows and names loved by history. Casino clicking chips and mafia swagger, palmed cash and favors from hotel suites with bellboys hopping up to feather filled skin tea shows. Dining room sparkling with chandelier and crystal, walls filled with other centuries paintings and the scene to make paradise jealous. And somehow also crumbling edifices and home walls with paint used as plaster, university windows shuttered, music and festivals shaking the street and telephone wires blood and rosary beads, hot rice, beans, lunch and dinner, aching feet, porch seat cigars, protest arrests and news of guerrilla fight deaths, mangoes growing cheap, spirit dolls with beads at their feet and families stretched wide into church aisles. These two sides met sometimes, crossed once in a while. Whether a believer up in Vedado needed a reader from their Baba Lawa or protesters walked through the streets calling for the ousting of Fulgencio or a hotel worker went from lifting luggage and pocketing tips to carving up pork in his mama's kitchen. People could scribble over the line. But Mercedes wasn't testing the aquamarine to see if she could dangle her feet. Mercedes lived in both worlds. She was born to parents verging on poverty during a hurricane that struck down the kitchen roof, but married into a political dynasty. To a man whose name was well-loved relic of passed down all the way from Cuba's independence from Spain. But by the time the story begins in 1958, Mercedes had already divorced this man. She'd already learned how to walk in that world and how to walk right back out. She had moved back in with her mother and on this particular afternoon, Mercedes walked into the house to find a stranger, an old acquaintance and her six-year-old son sitting in the living room. Her mother, Benita, of course was nowhere to be seen. She would be behind the closed door at the end of the room, the door with cracked yellow paint that smelled strongly of cigar smoke and orchids. 
because that's what her mother would be doing in there. She'd be sitting on a pillow beside her altar, black oil hair and waves crowning her head and puffing on a cigar until she went fully into a trance to speak to the spirit. But in the meantime, Mercedes' son, Max, was sitting on the floor of the living room, humming to himself and playing with a toy train between his old acquaintance who drives a taxi in the pricier side of the island and this other old man that she'd never seen before. If she hadn't been holding a loaf of bread and a few other groceries in her arms, she would have picked Maxie right off the floor and carried him away. Instead, she walked to the kitchen, heels clicking quietly on the tile, and set the food on the counter. Then she returned to the living room where the two men nodded at her and she gripped her son's shoulder, a smart white shirt crinkling under her fingers. Bring your toy, Maxie. We're going out. But as her son stood up, skinny with inward tilted knees, a full head of black wavy hair and bright green eyes, the door to her mother's room opened. Out stepped a woman in a skirt whom Mercedes didn't know, followed by her mother wearing a long cream dress, rosary beads between her fingers. The woman thanked her profusely, her fingers twisted into knots. Benita put her own hand on top of the woman, spilling the fingers there, and said nothing. The woman brushed past Mercedes and Max, and her mother kept her green gaze on her. Listo, Benita said, and the stranger nodded. No, Mercedes said. She took her son by the hand and led him into her mother's room, closing the door once the three of them were inside. The room was dim, the curtains drawn to the late afternoon sun, and there was only a candle or two lit. At the back wall was a pillow where she sat on the ground, a bowl of water beside it. A statue of La Virgen stood on the bedside table, draped with Benita's rosary beads. Maxi, go play, Mercedes said, pointing to the other side of the room. Once he was beside the window, she turned back to her mother and lowered her voice. We talked about this. You can't leave him unsupervised while you're in here. Benita's expression didn't change. Her dark eyebrows were even, her green eyes always opaque. Juan was there. Who is Juan? You know Juan, he grew up in the neighborhood. I know Juan, Juan is a taxi driver, Maxi said from the corner of the room. Bien, go back to playing your game. Mercedes put a thumb to her temple and twisted her fingers and lowered her voice even more. Really? See, he knows Juan, and so do you. Her mother nodded, satisfied. No, no, mom, I don't know Juan, and you don't either. You can't leave Maxie with people I don't know. Then take him with you. Take him to the boutique, her mother said. Mercedes looked at the ground, the only spot that would keep her from seeing her mother and her son. This was shame. She knew that. She should be used to the feeling by now, but it's done. They both knew that wasn't an option. Thank you. Bloody hell, wow. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm not supposed to swear on the Zoom. That's fantastic. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. So, um, tiny question, but I'm going to tell you something. When, when you get an email from uh, Carly, it comes from Carly Mercedes Gomez. And uh, Mercedes was the title of the piece. So my question is, what made you want to start writing about your, your grandmother during COVID times? It really was partly because of the pandemic. Um, I was feeling distanced from my family. And so it seemed like a really great time to dig into my family history um, and to talk to my dad about my grandmother more. Uh -huh. I didn't know that. That's great, thanks. Well, now for um, Annie. Annie's going to read us uh, some uh, some poems. I've had the pleasure of actually uh, reading them beforehand, but over to Annie. Thank you so much, Lou, and thank you, Jason and Leslie. Um, I'm going to read seven poems. They're all pretty short. Um, so here we go. Measure. Missouri nebulous. Never where I think it will be on the map have been living back in the Midwest seven months. Lake Michigan begins to freeze. Column of sunrise, reflected, Corinthian, motionless. Minus 10 with wind chill. I want to bite the sun. It would dribble like a clementine. Fahrenheit, ridiculous. Turned 25 this week. Bathroom scale reminds me that weight means how much I crowd into the earth. Another atmosphere would mean a slighter heart. I am unquiet and hopeful, built of star stuff. Toaster. The human brain weighs 1300 grams, about the heft of one two slice toaster. 
I love this equivalence. Picture a toaster on shoulders and torso and think of a non-existent Magritte with some title like the veneration of the mind. But how to kiss someone with a toaster for a brain, how to taste his mouth, touch his hair, falter in his ears. He would have to wear button down shirts. We could not take airplanes together. He would never make it past the TSA. I look at the word torso, all tendon and tall mouth trochee, retold vowel, muscular. At 14, I wanted to know word origins, but not to learn them. Toast, Old English, Middle French, brain parts brought from Greek. Toaster oven, the superior appliance, but less germane. I wanted to know, but not to learn. I hope I have changed. I hope I am less graceless. I am starting to learn different kinds of grace, the different kinds of being good. Of the spine, 200 distinct bones in the adult skeleton, 26 of those spinal, five of those lumbar, two of those I broke. But breaking backbones needs another kind of verb. I broke two lumbar vertebrae, sounds like dishware. Fractured is better, more medical, but still, I fractured two vertebrae sounds too much like I chose it. English needs better verbs of accident, another construction between active and passive. I fell 30 feet through a roof, too intentional. I was falled, not right either. First responders, weeks later, told me I fall good, must have a flair for it. I should have broken arms or ankles, never been able to walk again. I should have died, none of them said. I am not ungrateful. I have good luck, strong bones, no memories. I am about the same. All. A Polish Jew and a Greek Orthodox Italian go on vacation together. It begs a punchline. December, not quite Christmas, we drink wine on our rented porch from which we almost can behold the Parthenon. We have, we know, it all, passports and bodies, black coffees and tiropita for breakfast next to heat lamps, sound historical timing. Orange trees describe the sidewalks, stones knife blue in twilight, waterless Mediterranean warmth, capricious categories of race and religion enough in our favor for now, hot leucomates. At a cocktail bar called A for Athens overlooking the Acropolis, we are celestial, the gods we bow to. On the revolutions. <clears throat> the chutzpah of heliocentrism knocks me out. Luther dubbed Copernicus an upstart astrologer, something from the business card of a freelance millennial. Copernicus was Silesian. His given surname, Kopernik or Kopernik, Polish or German, he Latinized himself in Padua and knew four languages besides, Polish, German, Greek, Italian, but he paid little mind to orthographies. Alphabets too stringent, names too prescribed. He savored the sameness of stars across our tongues. Whatever makes one free. Birds of the Midwest. At the Indiana Dunes Visitor Center, I get a deck of cards that features 54 of the most compelling Midwest birds. Their names so metrical and full of fashion, white-throated, rose-breasted, red-shouldered. I never thought of bird shoulders. I like the indigo bunting and the common loon best for names though. Looking at the former, I think of flags and parades, festive plastic, Common, Latinate, Loon, Germanic, these twin kings of English adorn the king of diamonds. I touch Lake Michigan at the Indiana Lakeshore, so blue and temperate. Looking west, I can see downtown Chicago, even without glasses on. I love the northern flicker too, on the five of clubs, a kind of woodpecker, 
one of few that migrates. With first lines from the climate of Chicago Wikipedia page, its lakeside location makes it a center of conflicts between large volumes of warm and cold air. Like the winds here are Germanic tribes and the Roman empire. Summer sees me anxious. Prozac helps 40 milligrams in the morning with the bathroom light off, too fluorescent. Thunderstorms three nights a week. Two blocks from Lake Michigan, I rent a studio apartment where I am most grateful to dictate the kitchen. I have never lived alone. I stand at the stove waiting for water to boil, choose a leftover tomato half from the fridge, eat it like an apple. Tomato water sputters floorward, the fruit egoless, generous. I have lived in the Midwest once before, for nine months when I was 17 and 18. I have missed the middle of things, starts and ends, find me graceless. A watch pot never boils, the absurdest dictum of all. Of course it boils. That was great. Now you know what question I'm going to ask now. So um, I love Toaster. Hmm. I loved it the first time I read it. I think it came out in Tupelo's Quarterly. Yes. Yeah, in 2019. And um, I know we've spoken about this before. So some of those poems were written before COVID and some were written during COVID. So um, I'll probably open it up for a more general conversation, but I have to know, where did you get the idea of Toaster? Um, where did I get the idea? Um, I definitely... That's the metaphor. I just wonder where it came from. Well, I started with the, the first two lines, the human brain weighing the same as a toaster. Like, I don't know where I saw that but I thought that's so weird and like who why does this equivalence exist and it's so strange and I thought that was a great place to begin something um this poem definitely went through a couple of versions I can't specifically remember what it looked like previously but the 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 idea of like the Magritte painting with a with a man with a toaster for a head that sort of came to me later on. Um, yeah, this this poem is definitely kind of more lighthearted or more weird than a lot of things I write, and I'm very happy with it. Yeah, you should be. It's great. So um, I've got a general question here, but I want to say to the other fellows, this is. This is just a general question. If you want to ask anything or contribute or say, hey, I disagree with that, or ask Carly something about that brilliant first paragraph, that long paragraph, which is virtually, well, it sounded like a prose poem or any of the poems of Annie, feel free. But here's, here's a, a general one to kick us off. So in the last 10 to 11 months, friends of mine who are editors and journals say that the, the, the submissions are way up. So clearly people are writing a lot more and submitting a lot more to journals during COVID times. And that seems to be this, the case with a number of people. A number of people said, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm at home. I'm, 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 I've got these ideas coming out. But as well as that, there are a large number of people that are blocked. And I know this, and uh, Annie and I talked about this as well. And it's almost as though the times we're going through at the moment are so overwhelming that it's hard to cap, it's, it's hard to write about it and it's hard to escape from it. And I'm just wondering, um, the two of you and others, whether in fact you feel that, which, which side of the spectrum are you on? But feel free to ask any specific questions. So I'm gonna kick it open. I'm gonna push my chair back and just listen. Um, I'm happy to start with that. Um, I have been submitting a lot and working on my first book manuscript a lot in the last 10 months, but I haven't written a lot of new work. I've mostly been revisiting older things and editing, which is something that I don't always, don't often have the patience to do. But right now it's like, okay, I, if I'm not writing new poems, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm just looking at all these old poems and I can't not fidget with them. Yeah. Noelle? Yeah. Um, so for me, I, uh, 
I find that writing is sort of my way of coping with the world. And so um, I like to remind students who are blocked right now, because I teach um, creative writing too, um, that you, know, you should write in a way that helps you cope with the present moment. Um, for me, this looked like um, writing a ridiculous newsletter to my family and friends um, using Moldorama dinosaurs um, at the beginning of the pandemic to deal with the absurdity. Um, so, you know, I really try to encourage people to remember um, that writing can help you cope and that it doesn't have to directly respond to the experience. Um, so that that can help too. What do others think? Any other questions? Any other comments? I was just going to offer that, you know, coming from a, a non-writing uh, field myself, um, I more definitely more visual working in the, the architecture and, and built world. Um, but I, I really appreciate the, the imagery and, and you know, descriptive language that uh, both of the uh, Carly and Annie, both of your um, works exhibited, you know, uh, Carly and kind of you setting the stage with the two worlds of Cuba, kind of the, the quick hitting descriptors, um, you know, it was efficient, but extremely effective. Um, and all the, the small details, um, of, of the, the place where, you know, I, I had that image in my mind. And I think for writing about a, a place in a time that you necessarily weren't a part of, I, I did a fabulous job with that. Um, and Andy, I, I think the, um, the analogy for um, Toaster, again, you know, a, a Magritte painting, that was perfect. And I think having that right at the beginning uh, to be able to, to see this, you know, Toaster man um, and have that context, um, I thought that I thought that was the spot on and, and really appreciated uh, how that set up the, the rest of the poem. Odie. Thanks, Taylor. Yeah, thank you. Odie, I can see you there with your, your cat. Have you got any <laughs> questions or thoughts to share? Sure, yeah. I was just thinking, yeah, I found both of these pieces so moving and I'm really, they were really lovely to hear. Um, I think in my own experience, I haven't written at all in the past 10 months besides, which isn't exactly true, I'm writing letters, but um, I've been finding that the things that are most moving for me right now are um, cookbooks, like food writing. And I found neither of you had specifically food writing in there, but there was some of the richness in the descriptions and the textures, I've been finding those kind of things really moving. Um, and I was also thinking specifically, Annie, I loved the, the poem where you're talking about how we need like a different verb for like somewhere between active and passive. And I love that too, because I feel like one of the things that's happening right now is like, I, I'm a bookseller and I am seeing a lot of pandemic books and I have zero desire to read any of them. Um, and I'm feeling like, one, we're all living this. It seems like too early to be talking about it. So I'm happy that neither of the pieces touched on that. But I've also been thinking about how, like, it feels like I don't quite have the right language for anything that's happening right now. And so that was really moving and interesting to hear. Yeah, thanks. I, yeah, I this idea of never quite having the right language, I think, is sort of something that all poetry, if not directly, then indirectly addresses. It's like anything we write is just like approaching, you know, what we mean or what we, and of course the best poetry approaches the closest, but like it never really gets there, but you know, we keep doing it anyway. Anyone yeah, else? I, I was just gonna say, um, I remember reading once a, I think it was an Ann Patchett piece and she was talking about the experience of like holding a world in your head and then putting it on, on the page and how it's a little bit like pinning a butterfly to the page. It's always a little dead. It's always never quite what you want. Yeah. Um, which is so funny also to, to have you guys read and then to think about that where like for me, your pieces are so alive because I never had those worlds before. Yeah, going off of that, Annie, Carly, I, I completely agree. I thank you so much for sharing your work. I feel like I was completely taken into this new world. And I think on, on a personal level for during COVID, I've really 
connected with my writing again after being in an academic scene for a long time and um, really leaning into writing as a source of um, kind of like creative nonfiction, like accessing what's familiar, um, but then also playing with it and taking, taking it beyond what it is. Um, and so I kind of saw that just reading it and absorbing your work, I kind of saw this um, relationship of like the familiar, um, like Carly with your family and um, diving into that. And then Annie with, I, I just loved all the parts about the Midwest and your relationship with the different locations and um, also bringing in this reflective state of what you're, what you're feeling during this time and also before. Um, so I really appreciate both of you um, sharing your work. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. I wanted to second how much I loved um, Annie and Carly's writing. It was really incredible. I mean, Annie, I, I, those poems, I, I found myself nodding along the, um, at each moment because it, it did open up a little something for me. So that was, that was really helpful. Thank you. Uh, I guess I, I wanted to ask uh, Carly a question. Um, and it's related to, you said you've been working on that during the pandemic. So yeah. personally for my own writing, um, I, I, I usually write from a place of peace and I sit there and I'll meditate for a bit or I'll go out into the woods when I have the option. And that's where I write best. I'm not so good at writing amidst the chaos. Um, and so when, when chaos descended, I, uh, I realized I didn't have that place built up in myself to, to write from it. And so the writing stopped. And this year has been the work of learning how to write from different places. Um, I've been traveled, I traveled around quite a bit. I decided because I couldn't write, I, I started interviewing people instead and kind of pulling out my phone and just listening and reading, which is listening. Um, I guess research is a way that I sometimes retreat when I can't write to still feel like I'm writing. Um, research the story instead of actually put words to the page. So I'm wondering how you, Carly, in researching this project, you seem to take a really interesting tact is that it's not impersonal research, um, but it's definitely tied to your, your family and perhaps conversations with your father about it. Um, is that it? I, I'd just like to hear about that that sort of strategy. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, it's been a really interesting process, especially writing the beginning part of this novel, which takes place in Cuba, um, because my dad left there when he was five years old. So his memories are very fragmented, um, and they also have sort of the the uh, emotional and um, knowledge that a five year old would have, right? Like it's not seen in a very complex way which has been interesting so I sort of have had to go online to find um, the more complex sides of the political um, issues um, which has been really interesting so to try to draw myself out of that a little bit um, I think for me too because I'm not a non-fiction writer generally it's been really easy for me to make decisions about what to fictionalize and what not to um, and also because I'm fortunate to have a close relationship with my father where he doesn't mind me you know fictionalizing and changing things about history right a lot of what I touch on the story did happen but I'll be compressing the timeline a lot um, about her her journey here and and how that happened um, it's also been fascinating because we've pulled out a lot of my grandmother's old things, um, like her spirit doll. Um, and that's been a nice way to sort of engage in our memories of her together um, and has been really wonderful, um, especially during the pandemic. You know, we all had masks on um, when we saw each other over winter break um, and we sat six feet apart, but my mom and my dad brought out her spirit doll and and her beads and all of these things so that we could all look at them even though we couldn't you know hug one another or see each other's faces it was a it was a really nice way to um, remember our family intimacy I hope that answers your question 
Well, listen, I know that uh, uh, Jason will be wrapping up uh, soon. So I just want to thank, thank you, Carly, and thank you, Annie, and thank everyone else for, for um, contributing and uh, participating today. Just a closing comment. Um, apparently, uh, people are reading more books than ever. And uh, publishers, or at least certainly the Amazons of this world, are selling more books than ever. And yet at the same time, it seems to be increasingly difficult to get published. Hmm. So I can't quite figure that out. But I do know that Carly has got a, a book that uh, um, hopefully is going to come out. We're trying to get it to come out. And I know that, Annie, you're working on a collection. And based on what we've heard today, you can have no problems at all publishing. And that was absolutely stupendous work. So thank you very much indeed. Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Carly. Thank you, Annie, Lou. Thank you so much for moderating. And thank Adi, Taylor, Preston, and Noel for participating and Leslie for facilitating everything. Um, I think it's really wonderful to, you know, personally, just to hear everyone and to see everyone and to know that there's so much creativity um, and thought and things happening out in the world, even though we're a little bit more insular than we typically are. And I know that Noel, I think I mentioned earlier to the group that Noel is now publishing the Luminarts letter. Um, and so as Carly and Annie's pieces come to fruition, I know she's gonna wanna share that in the same for all of you and other fellows out there. So please be in touch with her and us as you know things are happening because we wanna make sure to support it and share the good work that you're all doing. Um, so thank you so much, um, really appreciate it and appreciate all of you who um, are watching um, and hope to see you next time. So thanks very much, have a good day. <laughs>